the screen. So um, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Arafianto, um, members of the organizing and steering committees, ITS administrators, faculty, students, and all of the conference attendees. Good morning to you all. I am in Omaha, Nebraska, in the middle of the United States. And currently, I think it is 7.30 p.m. Sunday night. Uh, so I'm glad that this worked out that it is your morning and just after dinner here for me. And I am thrilled and honored to have been invited and uh, to present as a keynote speaker today, kicking off this historic and wonderful event during the International Year of Sound, um, the first biennial international conference on acoustics and vibration. And I'm very excited to talk to you about some research that I have been doing over the past five years. We'll be talking about relationships that we've been looking at between acoustic and also other indoor environmental conditions and how they impact student achievement in primary and secondary schools. So I received a grant from the US Environmental Protection Agency. It actually started in the fall of 2014 and officially concluded last fall, but we have continued to um, analyze the data and working on getting all the publications out. The title of that grant was Evidence-Based Interactions Between Indoor Environmental Factors and Their Effects on K-12 Student Achievement. But basically the question was, how do indoor environmental conditions in primary and secondary school buildings, how do they impact student academic achievement? And the environmental conditions that our research looked at included, of course, acoustics quality, but we did also have members of the team that were looking at indoor air quality, thermal comfort, and lighting quality. And we wanted to see how all of these together in a classroom impacts the performance of the student. But we also had to acknowledge that there is a lot of research out there that indicates that the student's demographic information can also impact their performance, particularly economic information, um, that if they are economically disadvantaged, they will have a correlation with poor student performance. So we needed to control for such demographics. So we looked at the literature and at the time in 2014 and found that there were a number of studies that had been done trying to figure out how these conditions can impact students. But the evidence-based research was limited then. Most of the time, the articles you could find had only studied maybe one of the variables. So it was only acoustics or only thermal comfort or only lighting. Maybe they did two, lighting and acoustics. Uh, but there were very few that were more comprehensive than that and addressed measurements across several of these disciplines. A lot of the previous studies also did maybe asked subjects what they felt. They might ask the students or the teachers, do you feel like it is loud? Or do you feel like you are not comfortable thermally? Or do you think the light is good or bad? So they were quite subjective that the people would say what they felt. And we felt that when this research, when we were developing it, we would rather actually measure what the conditions were in the classrooms that the students were experiencing. There were many studies that also looked at indirect measures of the occupant effect. So they might have looked at absenteeism or maybe they um, looked at other, um, other ways to identify what the effects were on the occupants. But we were very lucky that we had strong partners with school districts locally. And so those school districts agreed to give us access to student achievement scores that the students take from these tests they take every spring, um, uh, every year. They also agreed to provide us with demographic data so that we could do the controls on the statistical analysis. Something else that we were concerned of when we reviewed the previous literature is that there may not have been a lot of um, statistical rigor in those uh, studies. And in our team, we were able to um, com 
construct a team of investigators that were experts in all of our disciplines. So I was the acoustics expert, but we also had a lighting expert, a thermal and indoor air quality expert, and an educational psychologist who was our statistical and experimental design expert. So they helped to guide how we uh, designed it and analyzed our results. So let me tell you more about the, uh, the research we did. We had five local school districts here in the middle of the United States, Midwestern. Um, in, I was in the eastern side of Nebraska and the western side of another state called Iowa. We had good contacts to these five school districts and we were able to get into 220 classrooms across those school districts. And they were at three or four different grade levels. We studied uh, classrooms for third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, and 11th grade. So there were 144 classrooms at the third and fifth grade levels. Here in the United States, we call those elementary classrooms. There were 32 eighth grade classrooms and 44 11th grade classrooms. And in each of these classrooms, we deployed two types of measurements. One we refer to as occupied measurements. What it really means is that we went in before school started, let's say on a Monday, and we deployed the equipment in the room and we left it in the classroom to log data continuously over the next 36 hours so that we would at least get data over two measured classroom days. So one full school day on Monday and another school day on Tuesday and then the team would go in and retrieve the equipment after school on Tuesday. The other thing that we were interested in, particularly our thermal indoor air quality expert, was interested in capturing different seasonal data. Here in Nebraska today, the temperature is uh, about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in Celsius off the top of my head, but, um, but we do get seasonal extremes, we'll get snow and um, we have to go into heating systems in the winter time. But in the summer and early fall and late spring, it can also get quite hot. So we are also doing cooling um, systems. So our systems have to be able to cool and heat the building. And our thermal IEQ expert was very interested in gathering data throughout those different seasons. So we would go into every classroom once in the fall, once in the winter, and once in the spring. And each time we went, we captured two days of data. So in total, we were able to get six days of occupied school day behavior. And I'll um, show you some samples of that later. I also want to say the other global type of measurements we made were unoccupied measurements, um, typically of metrics that we did not expect to change greatly with occupancy. We, the team would usually do that after school was dismissed. So here are some pictures of a classroom that our team went to uh, measure. We had a kit that we would place near the teacher's desk where we tried to protect our equipment within a cage so the students would not bother it too much. We also, there's a sound level meter hanging from the ceiling. The team became very innovative about how to put another sound level meter somewhere in the room that would not be destroyed by children in the classroom. And then here I believe is a, um, it is something logging daylight, a hobo data logger, uh, because um, we wanted to know how much daylight was getting into the class. So a little bit more about the measurement equipment, you get a closer view of that kit that we had. We had five kits constructed that we were deploying um, every two days. So that's how we managed in two years to uh, gather data from 220 classrooms once every season. So inside the kit, there was a, a bunch of equipment, but you see that there is a sound level meter that sat in the kit by the teacher's desk. And then as you saw in the picture on the previous page, we had this other sound level meter that we would hang. These all had to be powered by external batteries. So that's what you see there because we did not wanna have wires uh, hanging out anywhere, tripping up students. Um, I'm also showing that there is a door state logger here. Uh, this would tell us when the doors opened and closed, which was of interest to some of my other team members. And I don't know if anybody else is very interested in um, 
the thermal equipment or the uh, temperature equipment. I can speak a little bit to that, but you can see a listing of what other uh, equipment they uh, we gather data from. After school, for the unoccupied measurements, that's when we could go and take more detailed measurements of the geometry of the room, grab some photos of it. We could also um, measure illuminance. Um, we, because it would get dark, they could figure out what the absolute darkness was in the room and then compare it to when they turned on the lights. Uh, there is also other equipment we use to measure air velocity, indoor air quality, ozone, and after school is also when we would measure the impulse responses, which I will talk about later. So I'm going to review some of these briefly so that you can get a sense of the scope of the project. In terms of lighting conditions, uh, the, my colleagues were interested in how much electrical lighting was in the room, how much was coming from outdoors, daylighting from natural light. They also had these metrics they called horizontal sight angle, which it's bigger the larger the window width was because you'd have a greater view to the outdoors. And they were also interested in a metric they call view, which is how many layers can students see outside the window? Can they see the sky um, out farther, the ground, um, such things like that. So when we gathered all of the data, um, I can give you some global overviews of the data we um, captured. If you see a box plot like this throughout my presentation, the red line in the middle stands for the median value we measured. The uh, height of the box is the 75th percentile. The lower part of the box is the 25th percentile. And then the whiskers will show you up, out to the maximum value we measured and the minimum value we measured. Then if there are other pluses beyond that, they are considered outliers that they're much farther than the standard deviation of the sample. So we had 220 classrooms, and this just shows you a box plot of the illuminance in Lux that was measured across those rooms. There is a standard by the Illuminating Engineering Society that they recommend um, the average illuminance in the classroom should at least be about 200 Lux. And all of our classrooms this is a histogram of our classrooms, Lux on the um, on the x-axis here and the number of classrooms in each bin. And so we, all of the classrooms were getting plenty of electrical lighting. So they, none of them were not getting enough lighting. So now let me introduce the thermal and indoor air quality conditions. In terms of thermal conditions, they've looked at temperature, humidity, and velocity. And for indoor air quality, they looked at gas phase contaminants, ventilation rates, and particulate matter. So much of this data was um, logged every five minutes. So this is an example of the plots that we would get from the thermal comfort <laughs> measurements. In the x-axis here, it's time. And then you just see different metrics. This is the relative humidity that was being read, globe temperature, whether the doors were open or closed. Various meters were measuring temperature in the space. And um, as I said, most of the times, many of our um, our measurement equipment in terms of thermal and IEQ, we're logging data every five minutes. I believe I have one more plot of the IEQ, the indoor air quality measurements, which were also being logged every five minutes. In particular, I'll draw your attention to carbon dioxide, which um, is often used to calculate ventilation rates because the more um, quickly that carbon dioxide is dissipated gives the, um, the, my colleagues in thermal and IQ a sense of the ventilation rates. And uh, in terms of the global overview of the data, there is an ASHRAE standard 62.1 that suggests what ventilation should be in classrooms. And unfortunately, only 20 to 25% of our classrooms that we measured exceeded that recommended ventilation rate. So there were still many classrooms in our sample that did not meet the suggested ventilation rate. Okay, but this is an acoustics conference. So let me now talk about the acoustics. Um, in particular, we were interested in these three quantities, uh, which are discussed in the ANSI S12.60 classroom acoustic standard. Well, some of them are. We were interested in background noise and also reverberation time. And I'm also going to show you some data we have about what the levels were like in the Occupy classroom, particularly when people were talking so speech levels and also when there was no speech going on. Okay, so let me start with um, 
the ones that we gather from the impulse response. Remember, after school, we would go in with our um, omnidirectional loudspeaker and equipment to measure the reverberation time or to measure the impulse responses. And from that, we extrapolated. Uh, typically, we could extrapolate T20 and we would average across low frequencies, mid frequencies and high frequencies. So we had different metrics we could look at. We also looked at clarity index, which is said to uh, be a metric that could be helpful for speech intelligibility. And we also thought it would be nice to take our sound level meters and just do a one minute measurement of the A-weighted equivalent sound levels. So we knew there was no students in there at the time, and hopefully it was just mechanical systems running. And so we also just had the students log that. So here's some overviews of the data we had that we gathered from the 220 classrooms. This one is the mid-frequency reverberation time. And again, it's in a histogram format. So you can see the number of classrooms that had a 0.4 reverb time. There are about 45 classrooms in our sample that had that. So 15% of our classrooms did not meet the ANSI standard recommendations of um, 0.6 or lower reverberation time. But you can see that actually our reverberation times are not terrible. Here in the middle of the United States, it's pretty common that there would be acoustical ceiling tile in the classroom. And so that's why I think we do not find in our sample very long reverberation times as some others have reported from around the world. Here is a plot of the clarity. Again, um, like the reverberation time, I think because we had at least absorptive ceilings, the clarity indices all look rather reasonable, greater than zero dB. It's a histogram, so it's clarity, uh, the 50 millisecond clarity across mid frequencies um, on the x-axis and the number of classrooms in each bin. And then in terms of the sound level from that one minute measurement, we knew this would happen because there was a lot of data out there already about how many, many classrooms do not meet the guidance from the ANSI standard, which says 35 dBA. So in our um, sample, 95% of the classrooms we, met, we measured did not meet this. As a matter of fact, many of them were measuring, you could see even 46, 48, 50 um, dBA. All right, so that gives you a global overview, but I want to tell you about something different that we could do because we had logged the data in those classrooms. Unlike the thermal IAQ measurements, I said that they were logged every five minutes. Our acoustic equipment actually logged data every 10 seconds. So we had a lot of data over six occupied school days, every 10 seconds, we had a measurement of the A-weighted LEQ. And we had that across octave bands too. So we had it all the way from 32 Hertz up to 16 kilohertz. So what this allowed us to do is to use um, a machine learning algorithm referred to as K-means clustering. We fed the algorithm all of this data and asked it to cluster the data into two groups. So two groups that would be distinctly different from each other, but within each group quite similar. And once the computer program, the machine learning algorithm clustered them, then we looked at the two groups to figure out what was similar about them, given the data we fed into it. And as you might expect, we gave it octave information. So it's split into times when the speech frequency octave bands were high and the other cluster had basically um, sound levels where the speech frequency octave bands were not high. So we interpreted this clustering as, oh, so it's basically told us, we had we gave it all this day, data over the day, and it has told us that these are times when speech was happening, and these are times when speech was not happening. And here's a graphic to help you understand that. So this is one classroom day. The kids are basically in the classroom by nine. They are dismissed by 3 p.m. and uh, you see the A-weighted equivalent level on the y-axis. This is a particular classroom, classroom number 83 in the fall, the second day of the fall measurement. And so if we had all connected this, and this is basically in time every 10 seconds what the sound levels were that were being registered. Now, I didn't show you the details. There were two meters in every classroom. So we did do um, a, a averaging of those data 
an energy averaging of those two data so that we have one, one sound level that was um, energy average from them. And then from that, we did the clustering. clustering. And so the points you see in black here were clustered to be speech. And the points that you see in red were clustered to be non-speech. And then what we could further do then once we split those two, we could just look at an A-weighted equivalent of the speech values or an L-weighted, A-weighted equivalent level of the non-speech values, or we could even look at the L90 of the non-speech values. So there were different ways that this allowed us now to better understand what the students were experiencing inside the occupied classroom. One thing that we could look at was whether there was any difference in grade level. There has been postulations before that younger grades, students in the third grade and fifth grade, experience more speech during the day than the eighth and 11th graders do. And that is certainly what our data showed. So I'm just splitting out that of all the third grade classrooms about, um, this was the average amount of time in third grade classrooms that they heard speech compared to non-speech. So in general, on average, third graders heard speech 61.2% of their day, whereas 11th graders heard it around 55%. And these are standard deviation bars that just show you the spread across the data set. Okay, some other interesting metrics we can look at now that we have split the the levels that we've logged into a speech cluster and non-speech cluster, we could also look at statistical levels, which are the levels that were exceeded some percent of the time. So for example, L10 is the level that was exceeded 10% of the time. So it's more of a maximum value. Or L90 is the level that was exceeded 90% of the time. So it's more of an ambient or minimum level. And even this quantity then can give us a sense of the dynamic range if you take the L10 value and subtract the L90. I'll show you some plots of these in a moment. But I also want to introduce to you that we could also look at how often was a level exceeded in that classroom that day. So if I just look at the non-speech cluster, I could see how often did the students' non-speech times exceed 50 dBA or 55 or 45. So we looked at all these different metrics or how often did the speech levels exceed these. So I will focus on a, four of these values just to give you a sense of what the data tells us about what students are in the US here in the middle of the United States are experiencing. We'll look at some L50, L90 and percent exceeded levels. So let's start with the speech cluster. So remember this is now we've k-means clustered it. These are all the speech levels that students are experiencing in the classroom. And if I just take that speech cluster, that group for the 220 classrooms over the six days that we have data for each of them, then you can see that the level exceeded 50% of the time when people are talking is shown as a histogram here. So that L50 value is on the x-axis, and this is the number of classrooms in each bin. So if we just look at the most here, maybe 46 of our classrooms in our sample, those students were hearing higher than 63 dB when someone was talking more than 50% of the time, of the time when people were talking. So this is getting you know, a better sense of how those students are experiencing the classroom, rather than just looking at what the ANSI standard says to measure, right? The ANSI standard says reverb time, A-weighted equivalent background noise level. But now we see that the uh, soundscape that students actually experience, this gives us more um, insight into it. That other metric I looked at, percent of time that the speech cluster exceeded 65, how often were they hearing loud speech? And we can also see in the sample then that here it looks like almost 37 classrooms, they only exceeded it 20% of the time. But there were some, like uh, maybe 10 here or eight, that were exceeding this level. They heard greater than 65 dBA of speech almost 70% um, of the day. So that is quite extreme. And we can see how this might impact achievement uh, in a few slides. 
let's look at non-speech first though, before we get to the achievement part. So on the non-speech, this is more of an ambient type level. What's the level exceeded 90% of the time when no speech was being um, given? And so the max one here says 47 classrooms were exceeding, let's say 43 dBA, which is still much higher than what we want in the ANSI standard. Or another way to look at it is how often when the students weren't speaking, that's just the background noise they experienced in the, in the day, how often did that exceed 50 dBA? And so some of them exceeded it 100%, almost 100% of the time they were hearing louder than 50 dBA in that classroom, even when no one was talking, but some of them only exceeded it sometimes. So that could be scooting chairs. I mean, there are lots of other things that can cause noise in that occupied classroom besides speech. And that's what we like about having this logged data is it gives us more sense of what um, students were experiencing. All right, let me tell you about the demographics we uh, were able to get school districts to share with us. And then I will get to the statistical analysis. So on the demographics, school districts shared with us classroom aggregated data because we had measured these metrics in a classroom. So we wanted to know the average um, results from the classroom. So they would share with us what percent of the students in the classroom received free or reduced price lunch. And we use this as an economic variable because students um, in a certain economic category would uh, become eligible for this. So we would expect based on previous research that the higher the percent of students in that classroom that receive free or reduced lunch, the worse they already tend to do on student performance um, tests. We also got data on the percent of students in that classroom that had been identified as a gifted learner. And we got a percentage of uh, students in that classroom that were considered special education learners. What that means is they needed um, usually an assistant um, to help them with learning. On the outcome side, this school districts gave us the percentile rank, the average percentile rank for that classroom. They took all the students in that classroom, typically about 20 to 25 students, let's say, and they would look at the math achievement scores for all those 25 and average that, and we would use that as a metric of that classroom. We had that both for math and for reading at all four of those grade levels. So to give you a sense of the range of the data we would get, here's one of the demographic variables. This is the percent of students in the classroom who received free or reduced price lunch. And remember, this is in a way a demo, uh, economic variable, that the higher this percentage is, that is a more economically disadvantaged um, classroom. So we had the five school districts, and you can see we did have a range where there were um, classrooms that had very few um, free reduced lunch recipients to those that had a lot. So remember these box plots show you the median percentiles and max and min. Here's a, a, a sample that you can see what our math achievement scores were like when we received them from the school districts. This one I'm showing you by grade. So we have the four grade levels there and the box plots are read the same way as we've done before. And uh, so the third graders of our sample, the average third grade classroom demonstrated that they got a score of a 55 percentile rank on their math scores. And then you can see the differences. We definitely had less classrooms at eighth and 11th grade. And so there is a little bit less um, range there. All right, so now for the model, the statistics model, there was a lot of massaging and work on developing the model. But finally, we have come up with um, a model that has worked for all of our disciplines. And then we combine them all together to actually look at across all disciplines. But first, I'm just gonna show you results of the acoustics model itself. So in the end, many, many of the metrics would correlate with each other, right? So there were many metrics we were looking at, as I introduced to you before, the L50 of the non-speech, the L90 of the non-speech, the percent the non-speech exceeded 50 dBA. There were many of them. And so we, and they are of course highly correlated. So we had to make some decisions of what is the best metrics that we would want to use to study the effect on student achievement. And we thought that it would still be best to match the, um, the ANSI standard. The ANSI standard wants to know 
what the background noise level is that the students are experiencing. I mean, we believe it should be what the background noise is that the students are experiencing in the classroom when they are in the classroom. And we have that data because we logged it. So we decided to take the A-weighted LEQ of that non-speech cluster, every measured day that we have for a classroom, we had six days, right? So we would take the average one of one day, and then we had that for six days for that classroom, and we would arithmetically average those and have one value, which would be, this is generally the non-speech level that students experience in that classroom. Then the other thing we were interested in is, what is the, in a way, the signal to noise level that students would be experiencing. So people are talking in that classroom, the teachers, the other classmates. And so we can know what the daily average value of the speech cluster was and subtract the daily value of the non-speech. And it would give us a sense of that, in a way, the signal to noise ratio, which if you read the background of how the ANSI standard was developed, that was what they were really interested in. They felt that they needed a signal to noise ratio of at least 15 in order for there to be uh, good uh, communication in the classroom. So, so we did, we looked at every day's speech cluster. We subtracted that same day's non-speech cluster and that would give us a delta, a difference. And then we would take that over the six days of data that we had for each classroom. And we would arithmetically average those and use those in the analysis. And I just wanna be very clear that this value is not the same as this because this is being subtracted every day from the main um, speech cluster, whereas this is averaged across six days. All right, the other thing we kept in was the reverberation time, the mid-frequency average. We controlled for all those classroom demographic uh, information I showed you, and we also were interested in any interactions that might occur. Would things be different for a classroom with greater free and reduced lunch? Or would they be different for a classroom with more gifted learners? So that's what I mean by interactions. And so the results are in this table, what you see is this is on math achievement scores. And I am showing you the three demographics, percent free and reduced lunch, percent of gifted students in the classroom and percent of special education. And these all are statistically significant at the P less than 0.01 level as we anticipated. And the directions are as we'd expect that as the percent of free and reduced lunch in a classroom goes up, this indicates that the math achievement score went down. Or as there were more gifted students, this value went up. Or if there were more uh, students that need special education, then the level went down. That's great, that's what we expected. And the model is controlling for that effect. And then having controlled that for that effect, what we were asking is, do the acoustic variables have an effect? And yes, we did find that there is an acoustic variable that had a statistically significant effect. It happens to be the level of the non-speech, that A-weighted equivalent non-speech level. The higher that level is, the lower the math achievement score was. And then we did not see then though that the, the level of the speech to non-speech every day uh, had a statistically significant event, nor did we see the reverberation time. But there certainly is correlation going on here. I should say yes and no other statistically significant main effects, no, no effects on reading. That's why I won't show you the reading results. But there is, a correlation between these two. So when the non-speech levels are higher, there is a, a significant correlation to this signal to noise ratio, if I dare call it that. Um, so my statistical colleagues will say that there's this model, if there's any impact of this, it's already absorbed within the noise uh, metric because there is a significant correlation there. Okay. So I have a little more time, so I'll share with you in case any of you are interested about the other IEQ, indoor environmental um, qualities. So my lighting colleagues, they were very excited. They found that when a student had a greater number of view layers, so they could see the ground, the sky, and landscape, 
that when they had more views, they did perform better on reading than, um, than students in classrooms where there were not as many views. So that was interesting. And on the thermal and IAQ side, um, it gets quite detailed, but I think I'll just summarize by saying that the, the classroom occupants definitely, you know, because remember I said they, she was, my colleague was very interested in seasonal data and rightly so because there were differences in the seasons. In the winters, they preferred it to be warmer <laughs> and in the spring, they preferred it to be cooler. And so it did depend on thermal comfort across the season that that is what improved um, math scores in this case. And they did see also some better performance when there were higher ventilation rates, particularly in the cooling seasons. And one other thing that I'll highlight is that there were three different types of systems, the mechanical systems in the buildings that we went to. Some of them had a, a unit that we call a unit ventilator. And whenever across our whole sample, classrooms that had unit ventilators demonstrated or correlated with lower math scores. So we were very interested in that because the type of system is well known to impact sound levels. So we did do some further analysis of the type of heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, and the acoustics. So there were three main types in our sample. Some of them had centralized systems with a variable air volume or air handling unit, something like this, where there's some central system and it's distributing air. 43 of our classrooms had that. 122 of them had heat pumps that were serving just the single classroom. And 55 of them had these unit ventilators, uh, which you might see looks familiar to some of you. And as you just saw on the previous slide, my colleagues in Thermal IAQ found that the classrooms with their unit ventilators did worse. So we looked at whether or not there was a correlation between that ventilator type and the non-speech levels that were produced. And sure enough, there was. So these are the three types of systems, centralized heat pump and unit ventilators. We're still looking at them like histograms. So the A-weighted non-speech equivalent level is shown, and then the number of classrooms in the bin. So on average, the centralized systems had, let's say 48.4 dBA non-speech levels but the unit ventilators were more. So there was a statistically significant effect that if the classrooms had unit ventilators, they also had higher non-speech levels, particularly compared to those with centralized units. So this all made sense then that in their model, unit ventilator rooms were worse on achievement. And also in our model, well, the unit ventilator makes it more noisy that's also why it is doing worse on, um, students are doing worse in those classrooms. So we thought that was very interesting. So we did finally combine all of our individual models into one big statistical model. It had 26 independent variables, three in acoustics, four in lighting, and um, the remainder 19 in enduring quality and thermal comfort because they had seasonal variations. and. Um, because I know I'm, I want to leave time for questions, and also because I know it could be dreary to look at huge tables of statistics, I will just say that we were very pleased that when we ran the whole model, essentially the results are very similar to what we saw from the individual discipline models. We still see a significant effect of that non-speech level. The, some of the lighting metrics lost significance, but a lot of the thermal and IEQ um, metrics still retain them. So we anticipate getting that paper out by May of next year. So please be on the lookout for our final findings. Okay, so to summarize, I'd say that our, in terms of acoustics particularly, when there were higher average daily non-speech levels that the students experience, that definitely correlated to lower math achievement scores. And it was interesting because this was not the first study I had done on classroom acoustics. I had a former PhD student and uh, we did not do as extensive a study as the one I've just presented, but she and I had found that there had been impacts on reading ach achievement 
and other persons around the world had also found impacts on reading achievement. So it was a, a bit strange that we didn't find anything with reading achievement in this current study. But what we can definitely say to those of you who are interested in architectural acoustics and design, we should be designing classrooms to have lower non-speech levels that the students experience in the day. And then in terms of my colleagues, I will vouch for them that they would now also say, plus we should design for better views and better thermal comfort and good ventilation rates. Um, and certainly I don't know if in your country people use unit ventilators often in classrooms, but um, it's still very common here in the United States. And so we are working hard to make sure that people in the school design industry here understand that um, if they're using unit ventilators, that is uh, not a good sign because we've been finding a correlation with um, worse achievement scores. If you, go back and watch this recording again sometime, <laughs> you will see that I was very careful, I hope, to always mention it as a correlation, not a causation. My statistical colleague would really want me to make sure to make that point, that this in a way was an exploratory study, what we've done. We cannot prove that the reason that people did worse in math was because of any of the things that I mentioned. All we can show is that there is a relationship. And then to get to that next point, to study causation and really know, we do actually have to manipulate. That is the best way for us to be able to tell that if we had a classroom, and it was a background noise of 55, all, like more than 50% of the time, and we reduced it down to 35, do we then see an accompanying improvement in achievement? That is when we can say causation. So unfortunately, this study does not do that. We just lay groundwork and show correlations. We did try, we did take additional data. We had another year of funding that we went into 55 of the classrooms and tried to make some changes. We tried to influence the school districts, but it was not easy to do. And we are still in the midst of, um, it was easiest to change lighting. I will be more clear. Easiest to change lighting, most difficult to get them to agree to change ventilation rate or anything that would affect the background noise level. So we're still in the process, so we're gonna study that. And if any of you are interested in this area, I would certainly encourage that if you could do work where the school districts would allow you to measure before and see what student achievement scores were, and then make improvements in the way that we're suggesting and see what it is afterwards, that will be very convincing um, as a causation, not just correlation. We'd also recommend that we should try studying individual student data in the future. We did it at the classroom aggregate level, as you saw. In those 220 classrooms, though, there were 7,000 students, and certainly there could have been differences there that might have been explored more, but we didn't have an opportunity to do it. So something that other research groups may consider. So in summary, our hope with this study was that we wanted to help provide better evidence-based understanding of how all these conditions could interactively affect student achievement. And if we know that, then we can help school communities to know how to spend their money so they can optimize student achievement and also help the school design community so that they understand that, yes, it is worthwhile to prioritize these environmental qualities so that students will learn better. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Here are some shots of our extensive measurement team that went out and did all the measurements. And I'll be happy to take some questions. I will try to say it in Indonesian too. I had to Google this, Terima Kasi. So I hope that was right. That's perfect. Terima oh, kasih. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Professor uh, I think I think it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, I mean Somehow it's similar to what we have at the moment. I, when I, I would like, I hope it is not political, but I would like to quote the, the first lady of the United States that uh, when we when they go uh, when they go low, we would like to go high, and it means that when the uh, acoustic performance should, uh, I mean the background noise should go low, then uh, hopefully we we can achieve the student achievement in terms of academic would be uh, much higher than we expected, but. 
uh, most of uh, Indonesian school, in particular primary and and uh, and uh, primary school and high uh, um, mid school students, are also having the not similar to what what you have. I mean, acoustically they are uh, high reverberation times, and then next to the highway means that the transportation or, or traffic noise is going to be horrible and so on and so forth. But I think it's going to have, a, I think we're going to have a more than a few questions here for you because uh, we have a similar situation here in Indonesia. And I, I would like to note as well that amongst the, our audience, there, there are also uh, uh, architecture uh, uh, in, in our audience. Uh, I think this also with a trick uh, more uh, question in terms of uh, building science as a whole. Um, I would like to have, I think we have, uh, we have uh, more than enough uh, time, around uh, 30 minutes or so, because we uh, uh, finish early in the ceremony, so uh, we have uh, more than enough time to discuss. I would like to invite uh, questions. Uh, you can raise your hand using the raise hand button. Uh, you can ask directly for Lily and I hope you don't mind. I call you Lily, and um, no, I don't mind at all. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> um, and there is one in the either, chat too, so some right, people and, may and, also. And also, you can use the chat room as well. So whichever uh, convenience to all of you, uh, either directly uh, speak to Professor uh, to Lily and and, and uh, use the chat room. I think you, you may answer the first question here yeah, from sure. Mario Batura, Batubara from LAPAN, uh, Aeronautical Space Agency in Indonesia. Yes, is there any isolation system to protect the noise from outside? There's certainly, um, that's in actually the ANSI standard. It does talk about transmission of sound between classrooms and also from um, outdoor to indoor. In our case, we just measured what the resulting sound levels would be in the classroom. So we did not concern ourselves greatly with how strong the, the walls were in terms of preventing sound from getting into the classroom. Um, most of the schools, so environmental traffic noise or such is not as large a problem here in the middle of the United States because we have a lot of space. <laughs> so so, um, so we did not, even though I know that there were, you know, there, there are good wall constructions and we were working with a design firm in town called DLR Group and they certainly understand the ANSI standard very well. But unfortunately, I did not um, gather that data. Your other part of your question is, do you have observation results of student psychology related to the indoor environmental measurement. Um, I will interpret this one way. If you meant it another way, then please let me know. Uh, we definitely tried our best to do outreach with the students because this was actually a major component of our grant. Um, when we applied, we were asked to show how our grant also would engage with the community. So every time we went into classrooms, we did offer up the teacher that we would come in with our team to discuss the data and talk about what we were measuring. And then after the study, we've gone back and spoken with um, parent teacher groups and also school boards about the results that we've gathered. So I guess that's not necessarily how they felt. Maybe you were asking how, this, how the students subjectively perceived the room. We did not get that, but, um, but we did try to excite them about science and, and have them think more about their indoor environment. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. But for the second question is, I mean, so you have a, uh, some measurement of the uh, indoor parameter uh, inside uh, your room. So my question is uh, related to the second question is how the mentality affect, uh, especially on the student related to the, uh, your parameter measurement. Right. So we did not um, ask the students questions. So I, you mean oh. that like if it happened to be a 55 dBA, did they uh, rate it that they were unhappy? We didn't. So here in the United States, um, whenever we want to do tests on human subjects, 
we have to re run it by something called an institutional review board. I am not clear on how broadly that has done across the world, but in the United States we do. So if we're going, and, and it's worse, not worse. Let me say it's more difficult if the persons are minors under the age of 18. So we did not want to complicate our study in terms of asking mm -hmm. persons under the age of 18 what they mm -hmm. felt. And so we believed that just directly measuring mm -hmm. the, um, the physical quantities would be a okay. better way of doing this study. Okay. okay, thank you very much for nice explanations. Oh, no problem. Thank you. I would like to ask another, perhaps from the audience, another question for the for the speaker. If not, I would like to ask one myself, uh, if I, if I, if I may. Um, <laughs> um, do you think that the end of the study, because uh, uh, will you propose something that's uh, considered to be extreme, such as uh, erecting um, noise barrier or something, if um, the source of noise actually from the outside of the classroom um, because it's quite straightforward uh, solution, but it is not aesthetically uh, approved in, in terms of um, not to mention that the, the growth of the, uh, the noise itself is going to uh, in the 10 or perhaps more years is going to be useless, the barrier. What do you think uh, uh, the approach of uh, noise abatement in, in terms of, of classroom? Yes, I... Um... I don't talk much about the sources of the noise. So I, you know, and, you know, cause it's, you know, we log the data. We don't have anybody, we logged it by instrument. We did not have any person there to say, oh, that was the classroom next door. Oh, or, oh, that was a train going by outside or, oh, that was the mechanical system started. And so the system widened. So it is difficult for us to know what the sources of noise, but one way that I feel like, I guess what I would like to say is that, in a, I would like to think that we just measured the outcome of any noise source on these classrooms, right? So we are just logging what the sound levels are. And we have octa, like we have that octa band data too. Wow. And no matter what the source, it does still seem like there is still a significant correlation that when the students are experiencing higher non-speech levels throughout their day, they are going to do worse. So I do feel like that is a good argument to sort of go off and say, yep, so therefore we need to reduce anything that is going to cause noise impacts in this classroom. So if that is a weak wall between this classroom and the neighboring classroom, we need to strengthen that. If that is a weak window, because this classroom happens to be right next to a train track, then yes, we need to think about noise barriers or you know, ways to strengthen that. If it's because we're on the path of an airport flight path, airplane flight path, then so I do feel that this, the findings of this work can give, um, can give evidence to anybody who wants to say, here is my school that I'm designing or the site that I'm given. And if we do not put blah, 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 <laughs> to attenuate the noise, we're going to have a problem because their study has shown that if you are going to make the students experience higher non-speech levels in that room, they're going to do worse. Does that get at your question, Danny? Right, yeah, yeah. thank you very much. I, I think we, we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, Asha, perhaps? Uh, um, yes, you? sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, Good evening, Professor Lily Wang. Hello. <laughs> I say good evening because I know in USA it's evening. And yeah, it's kind of exciting topic actually. And yes, thank you so much. Um, but I have two questions, but it might seem silly question actually. <laughs> the first question is, I wonder why did you all, why did you choose only two variables? Um, I mean, in mathematics and reading, and I think noise can also affect the 
sciences or art classes too. And mm -hmm. the second one is um, noise can be preferred, can be, can be affected by personal preference. I mean, uh, some students might accept that kind of noisy, noisy condition, but the other can't stand with that noisy condition. Uh, do you consider that kind of thing in your topic, in your research? Thank you. Yes, thanks for those questions. Um, so I believe the first question was the outcome variables. So we only looked at math achievement scores and reading achievement scores. And why did we not look at other um, areas? One reason was that um, it is required in the states that we're working in, um, Nebraska and Iowa, to do standardized testing every year in these two areas across different grades. So if we, because we wanted to do a number of different grades, so we had targeted third, fifth, eighth, and 11th, and the tests that they all take in those grades, they all take a math achievement test and they all take a reading achievement test. So that was one reason that we just honed in on those two scores because that they were already taking those um, every year and it's mandated across all the school districts that we were studying. And even though they did not take the same tests, not everyone, because some of them in the state of Iowa were different from the state of Nebraska, but still they were these two topics. And that's why, so in a way it was ease that those are the two tests that they all took. And um, so that's why, you know, they, we often get the question of why didn't we um, administer our own test, you know, or some other um, outcome variable. But it just seemed that using something that was already standardized or normed across the communities would be easier. They already had to do it. So we didn't have to introduce and take time away from their lessons or anything. They were already going to do it without us coming in. And so that's one reason. And then your second question, I believe, was about how students may have different noise preferences or, you know, they might, some of them may be more sensitive and some of them may not be more sensitive. And that is absolutely true. But I think that's why it's nice to do it as a classroom aggregate. Or when we did it in our study, right, I mentioned that we had average the scores across all the classrooms. And so in a way, there might be some students that were sensitive and some that weren't, and it blurs when we do it as a classroom aggregate. When I was talking about future work, you're absolutely right. that I, That's why I feel like if we could get down to individual levels, there could be more to be learned. But right now, it was a... a Again, we get into, we run into difficulty here um, in the United States if I want to get identifiable information from students. Um, so it was safer for us to do it as a average across the classroom. Similar to your question, I sometimes get asked about teacher experience, you know, that wouldn't that make a difference? You know, that more than just do, you know, like we're talking about classroom level. So then people will say, oh, okay, at the classroom level, Maybe this class had a really good teacher. Maybe that class had a really bad teacher. And that could be a reason that their scores were the way they were. And my statistical colleague, who is a co-investigator on the Strat, he says that that is why we needed 220 classrooms. That's what he would say, is that if we had 10 classrooms, then that could be a problem that there was that. But the fact that we tried to get a much larger sample helps us to alleviate those types of concerns. So, thank you for your questions. Yes, thank you so much for your answer. <gasps> thank you. Is there any more from the audience of questions uh, in chat room or uh, direct question to Lily? All oh, right, there, there you go. You, you have a question from chat room. Oh, okay. um, about the measurement in the uh, cage room and uh, separation on speech and non-speech data. Yes, so the sound level meter was inside that cage. Yeah, was there effective using the cage on the measurement? Um, 
it is expected to be minimal. You know, in general, we would say that any physical um, structure would really impact wavelengths that are approximately the size of that, right? So our cage is, the bars of the cage are fairly small, like what, less than, less than a centimeter, I guess, or something. So though we're talking about kilohertz in terms of frequencies. So we do not, I will say I did not actually test it, like, you know, put the meter inside the cage or outside the cage to see. But my, my intuition is that I do not expect that uh, at the, except for maybe at the very, very highest frequency band that we looked at, which was 16 kilohertz, um, I would not have expected that it would have a great deal of impact. And then elaborating more on the k-means clustering, how did it separate the speech versus non -speech? So we fed, we use MATLAB and uh, software program. And so MATLAB does have uh, a k-means clustering algorithm within it. So we created a MATLAB data structure that included the 220 classrooms. And then for every classroom structure, it had the daily values for the six days. And it would have the basically every data point at every 10 seconds for the two meters. <laughs> and then also it had all the octave bands. So every 10 second data point also had all the octave bands of data. So you just give the computer algorithm this all that data and says, this data point, here's what it looked like. This data point, this is what it looked like. And, and then the the software program then takes all those data points and then like you like I showed in that one graphic it splits them and says these are similar based on the data you gave me and these are similar and since we gave it octave band data it makes sense that that's how it split it it split the categories into this group has high speech octave band levels and this group does not so for more information on that I might have to add to my grad students <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> right. I think we have another from that for that question. Mas Ahmad Ainun, Bongo. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Pak Tani. Uh, hello, Professor Lily. Uh, just a uh, silly question, too. <laughs> Uh, does it ever cross your mind that this research will take an enclosed environment such in a dorm or a boarding school that may take care of diminishing the, or reducing the non measured variable to know the correlation between noise and student achievement? I heard a little bit of, so would, can, uh, can you rephrase the question for me? I'm so sorry because I was hearing some buzz and it was distracting me. I apologize. <laughs> Right. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, does it ever cross your mind that this research will be, will be taken in closed environment, such in a dorm or a boarding school, that may take a role of diminishing or reducing the non-measured variable to know the correlation between noise and student achievements? So I got the part that did it, did it occur to me that in a closed environment, like a boarding school that, um, so you mean a place where they also live, is that what you're thinking? That they also live there throughout the day. And so is it possible that we could extend it to study um, what the students are experiencing the whole day long what? in their school environment? It's an idea. I. I think we were very interested in the room in which they actually learned math. And then they go take the test. Often, sometimes they take the test in a different room. So that's also a question that sometimes I get asked is, what about the room that they actually took the test in? But what we hoped was that this is, they are, particularly for elementary school students, they are in that same room all day long here in the United States, the third, the, the elementary school students basically stay in the same room and they learn. For the eighth and 11th grade, that's not the case here in the United States. They go from room to room, right? So they go to this room to learn math. They go to that room to learn language arts, that room to learn science. 
So we targeted the math rooms. We only measured the room in which they learned math. And then we gathered the scores from all the students who learned math in that room. So now if you're talking about living, I guess what I fear is that like, so we thought that that was really the thing. Like if you're in a room and the teacher is trying to teach you about algebra and you cannot hear or you're hot or you can't see that these are the reasons that you do worse on math. If you are saying now that it, I mean, of course it could be, right? That there is other aspects of the students' lives. We already know economics, how much support they're having, you know, like I already mentioned how good the teacher is, whether, you know, just even natural talent. Those things are, are much more difficult to characterize and we might have to have designed the experiment differently, you know, to, to be interested in that. But if, but in those cases, I also would have been like, just knowing my own children, my own children wear headsets all day long. <laughs> so, so, you know, they're not even listening to the room. <laughs> like, you know, they've got their earbuds. And so I feel like actually, if we're talking about how they live, then we may actually really have to think about how they live, not just the built environment, but their actual oral sonic environment. So that it would be an interesting future study. Okay, so uh, just to know that uh, lots of in Indonesia there are boarding schools. They say okay. they call it a pondok pesantren or I don't know what it said in English, but maybe it could be a good a place to to study the actual uh, effect on environment noise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in the correlation between the noise and the student achievements. Thank you. Absolutely. I hope to see you Thank present you. on that in the future. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, is there any? Oh wow. There, there is not a question. I think I think it's get, getting harder and harder uh, across the time now. Uh, <laughs> as, yeah, because it's uh, uh, from morning to to evening. So um, <laughs> in Indonesia, it's getting harder and harder. Um, this is another question um, from Tendi. Uh, is there any research or observation in test condition? I think it would be more interesting if environmental aspect could affect student test performance. So That's I think you're asking what I was also mentioning that we do hear a lot when we, we are presenting this is what was the condition in which the students took the actual test? So they, you know, they take it in April, as I said, typically. And um, because I have children in that in many, one of the school districts you know we get told like as parents that okay next Tuesday your students will be taking the wait in here we call it the map test you will taking the map test in, in math and I think we just could not control it like you know for the elementary schools the most common thing is that they were taking it in the same room that we were logging but we did not log on the days that they took those tests. As a matter of fact, the school districts were very adamant that we not do that because they weren't interested in causing any sort of distraction for the students when they were taking those tests. Um, so yeah, we, we did not log it. The, for, for the higher grade levels, the eighth and 11th grade, I believe that it was more common that they would take these standardized tests in April in a different room than the room that they learned in. They would possibly take it in what's called their home room. So they do have some home room. And on the day of a standardized test, they basically just stay in their home room and take a, a big bunch of tests all on the same day. Um, but we did not log that. So we do get asked that. We don't have that data. We still would like to believe that we you know, that maybe there are, that we believe that on the day of the test, everybody's staying quiet. And of course there could be background noise, but in, you know, but that the schools themselves are very interested in minimizing noise impacts on, on their student scores. So we still like to think that what we were trying to capture is the effects of the noise and the environment that they were learning in every day and it just culminates in this test at the end of the year. So, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, 
Oh, there, there you go. Uh, Pak Tajuddin, Mas Tajuddin. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, okay, you uh, can proceed. Uh, hello, Professor Lee. Uh, uh, my name is Rafi, and probably I have, uh, I'm a bit curious, like, uh, did you find any finding about how much is the maximum number on how low the DBA could be uh, acceptable? Like, is there any point where it could be too quiet even for the student? And uh, I imagine it would be very disorienting if, uh, disorientating if uh, the sound was too quiet. And if you have the finding, is that also correlate with the student achievement? I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Rafi, for the question. Um... So the lowest value that we measured was, I think, 34, 33. I have it on a plot. I think I'm sorry. I, I, it is not. It is not extraordinarily quiet. The the ANSI standard says 35 dBA, and there was certainly no place that was like 25 dBA or even quiet or like a concert hall level. So we just do not manage to achieve that in any of our classrooms in our sample. So it's a good question though, that yeah, can things be too quiet? Um, because I believe certainly in open plan offices, that is something that is believed to be a problem, you know, that we cannot have it be so quiet that once somebody drops a pen, that it sounds so loud because the noise floor is so bad. Um, but I don't think that we had that situation happen in our classroom sample. Um, so, so yes, but certainly for open plan offices and maybe, uh, Professor Hunkisto might have more to say on that because I know he's another keynote speaker and he is an expert in that area. But but no, not in classrooms, I don't think. There you have it. You, get, you have the teaser. You have to attend <laughs> the second keynote then. <laughs> and then ask the same question to uh, Paul Terry. Well, I think that concludes our uh, today. Uh, a wonderful presentation and excellent discussion. I think not only, I hope, uh, my, my impression is that we, uh, we get uh, some ideas to, to our future project in this particular research in terms of acoustic condition in uh, schools. I uh, hope you too uh, have uh, some ideas uh, that put your, uh, your research ahead in, in, in the future. Hopefully this has uh, been, uh, for me, this is a very fruitful discussion and I would like to Thank you particularly, and of course, our audience that actively engage in this uh, first uh, keynote speaker. And um, thank you very much. Uh, I have nothing to uh, left to, to conclude, and I, I have to turn it back to our master ceremony. Thank, thank you very you. much, Lee. Thanks very I, much. I, I really hope that we can uh, we, we can contact you. Uh, hopefully, we can discuss further in this in this in this new very new future in in terms of working on uh, building science uh, particularly acoustics uh, in, in the classroom absolutely and i have never ever been to indonesia i certainly hope to have an opportunity to come in person sometime in the future so Fantastic. but this was great thank you so much right. for the invitation and opportunity hopefully we can meet each other again in asa meeting or elsewhere yes thank you thank you back to you master ceremony